I shall put this on. My name is Danica Purk. I am president of Siemen and uh, president of Blade School of Management. Uh, in fact, the first, or uh, one of the first, if not the first, management schools in Eastern Central Europe, established in 86. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and uh, 25 years ago, in 93, I became president of Siemen which was then standing for Central and East European Management Development Association, and today is a global association. This about me. And I'm very, very happy to be here. And it's my great pleasure to, uh, to run this panel, because uh, you can be sure that you will go home more confused than you came, and that you will learn something, too because we have uh, very interesting people here with very different opinion, because I was asking them to send me in front some ideas, etc. But you know, this world is like that, that if you want to really be um, advanced and good, and you know, you have to work with open mindset around, and you have to uh, also to, uh, to accept, even if you don't agree, some other concepts. So with that, I start. And I would like to tell you that I have here with us Yuri Tazov. Where are you? Can you, can you? Yes, Yuri will speak in Russian. Yuri Tazov is president of Russian MBA League, as a Russian MBA Association. Then I have next to him Veronika Kutsoeva. She is professor at, at uh, IBS school the school that our dear Sergei is leading, who will see it later. Perhaps he will come. And she is director of MBA program. And we agreed that the, the Russians may speak Russian in their country. So be just ready if you don't speak Russian that you take this apparatus, that you are prepared. Then we have with us uh, Georgi Ilyev, director of um, uh, emerging markets in AMBA. I would like to say immediately that AMBA was the, you know, it's one of the biggest international association in the world, and that AMBA was the first who understood that, you know, that even in the, in the countries where management education doesn't have the same tradition as USA, they can have good schools. And so they came to accredit the first management school already some time ago, and I always I mean, I mean, I always want to mention that because I really have appreciation of that. And, um, and then we have with us Marco De Novelis, obviously Italian name, although he is uh, working in London. He is uh, business, uh, business because. I don't know whether you know that, BB. It's not Brigitte Bardot, but it's <laughs> business because. He is editor of that magazine, which was recently acquired by GMAC. And here I would like to uh, graduate management admission council. And here I would like, you know, I'm probably the oldest one here, or at least the longest one in management education. So I have some special rights, I think. And I would like to use this right and to tell you that this is also a great institution, GMAC, and that I was Many years ago, when I attended first time their meeting, also advising to Russians and to all Siemens members to go there and to learn from this association. This business because he is, as I said, editor, and he, this is the leading online publisher dedicated to graduate management, management education. So that is Marco. And then we have with us Andrew Jack. And Andrew Jack is the global education editor for the Financial Times. So um, also very reputable name. Uh, so it's really, uh, really very nice to greet you here in Moscow. And then we have Sergei Ermak. Sergei, he is a deputy director of Analytics Center of Expert Russia. So this is our, our panel. And Sergey, as I said, Masoyedov will, uh, will um, uh, probably um, come a little bit later. So why are you here? You are here probably because you want to, want to learn something about 
the views of the ones who are creating the criteria and publishing about them, etc., and something about the ones who are using them, you know, as a promotional uh, tool, and somebody who has some, some people who have some doubts whether these criteria of this, uh, of the rankings, although none of them is really responsible for, uh, directly for this, but, you know, we are here to, to talk about that. So, if I may uh, make a little introduction as the moderator, I would say that accreditations and rankings and all kind of different ratings are becoming increasingly problematic. Accreditation tell us which institutions are the best copies of the old, this is my attitude, my view, the best copies of the old traditional institution. And as ratings are based on this accreditation, uh, and of course, if you are based on this, uh, on this um, accreditations, the um, outcomes are not surprising. And, uh, and uh, of course, every year there are some variations in the number. Are you number eight or number 10? But I didn't see, and I would be very happy if my colleagues would correct me, I did not see that one of the best schools in Russia or in Eastern Central Europe or in Latin America would come under first 10. Although they are innovative, they are fantastic, they are big, they are having you know, international students, they are high quality, it's impossible. 89 or something like that still perhaps. So this is, this is one of my, uh, my statements and questions. And, uh, and the, what I am very much disturbed is that you must have accreditation of Equis and ASCSB, and then you can only enter in Financial Times ranking. So where is here independent view on that? You know, it's a question. So, uh, so I, I would like to say that, that I was um, very impressed by the research made in Russia by two professors of mathematics, Rizhov, are you here perhaps? And the other one is Anwar Irmatov, who, were, uh, who are professor of doctors of science in mathematics. And they were, uh, uh, through their mathematical models, looking two main criteria of Financial Times ranking. And they came uh, to the conclusion that 43% of these results are based on financial, of the weight. It's 43% of weight is given to salary matters, how much your graduate earn. So you are really making these people who come to study to management, uh, in my view, you know, really, uh, very much uh, crazy about the money, salaries, etc., and or the, to leave the country. Why should I be in Albania if the salary is such a small one, or somewhere else? You know, because I can never ever be equal partner anywhere concerning that. So uh, they made MBA ranking over you in 2018. These two guys, and you, I know them, and you know them certainly too. Some of you. So. They don't, these uh, rankings, usually they don't reward highly new concepts, innovativeness in organization and methodologies. In my view, all this leads to another failure, comparing chalk and cheese. A school can deliver top performance in its region, be very international, highly evaluated by the business world, they say, because of you, we became number one in the world. Hidden champions, you know. They are saying often that, these most innovative companies, because of you. But they are in a wrong part of the world, living and working, with only few multinationals. Because one of the criteria is in how many multinationals. You know, Slovenia is two million inhabitants. We, don't, we have our biggest multinational companies which is multinational. It's a Slovene company working in different countries of the world, having 10,000 employees. That is the biggest company we have, you know? So how can you then evaluate your students working, you know, in multinationals if they are staying in your, their own country? So, uh, um, 
uh, what I want to say are, it would be so if they are created by EFMDV and ASSB, they are sometimes, in spite of not fulfilling the conditions or a political, strategical, you know, they are sometimes these uh, associations, agencies, are creating them also out of political reasons. I can tell you out of my own practice, I am on advisory board of the management schools in Stellenbosch, South Africa, which is considered like the best one because it has the most org accreditations possible and ra uh, ranking not in FT but all the rest. They are, uh, 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 but we talk at every meeting about that when I come. I am on advisory board of the third, second or third best business school in China. I'm on advisory board in, in uh, Paris, in Belarus. So I know what these schools are because I'm there every second, third month, you know, and I know what are they, whether they are really good or not. And this Chinese school, for instance, if, if you are in Slovenia, you cannot get a Equus accreditation because you are not international. Or if you are not, it's not about me, but in general I talk because one of our schools was 12 years waiting to get it. Four times they had to go and then they got it and still they are not international for their reasons. But this Chinese school, they didn't have one single student who would be from somewhere else. Last year they started with an international master and I helped them to bring seven countries, mm -hmm. also two Russians. So, uh, just to let you know that it's also a lot of politics in that. And, um, uh, and I also wanted to say that I was not surprised to read about a very innovative institution in management education that purposely does not want to go in any accreditation process. For me, it is clear that it is necessary to rethink accreditation and ratings we need ardently other performance criteria <coughs> if we would, for example, evaluate schools on how often alumni of that certain school violate standards of business ethics and have been involved, involved in court cases, which was the case with Harvard Business School, for instance. The ratings would, and I'm an alum now of that school too, so don't you worry. I mean, I am not uh, having something, you know, in the sky uh, just in invented. I saw it. I was studied there. If we would, for example, evaluate school on this, how they evaluate standards of business ethics and how have been involved in court cases, the ratings would already give another picture. It is very important that criteria of excellence and relevance, as stressed by the recently published manifesto, which Simon published, you know, the manifesto changing the course of management development, combining excellence with relevance. If, you know, that would be, they would, we, we think that they, they, this, uh, um, uh, that, that um, the guidance of judging the performance of business schools should be different. And I believe that with the great panel of today, we can make a substantial step in the right direction. And uh, I was introducing you, the people already, so we come really from different countries, different institutions, different views, and let us now talk about and see what, uh, what uh, you know, what, in which direction, because I believe, you know, once many years ago when De La Breccio was still in Financial Times, and I was telling her, I said, this, I cannot really agree with your criteria, and then she said, why don't you bring us other ones? Why don't you propose us some other ones? And I think that we are also not active enough. All these international associations, one of them I am leading, we should be much more you know, active and come with our proposals and help them, because we live every day this, we are all deans of management in development institutions, and we should do our best to influence that on such a way that this would be acceptable and measurable, et cetera. No. So here I would like to give uh, to our two Russians the first floor, to Mr. Tazov, uh, and then to the professor from Ranepa, so that we can take this apparatus on for both, and then we go further. OK, so Mr. Tazov, floor is yours. Uh, Thank you, Danica. 
you have asked, uh, uh, you have made a powerful momentum. Uh, you raised so many questions uh, that I uh, have an immediate desire to start commenting them. But nevertheless, I will probably start uh, from the beginning, from what I was intending to present. Uh, regarding our local Russian experience, that is the uh, rating of uh, Russian uh, business schools, MBSU, which we call uh, people's rating. Because as we know, Russian business schools, with the exception of perhaps one, the St. Petersburg uh, University, are not uh, represented in international r ratings or rankings. And the experience uh, that we have in Russia, I guess, will uh, be more interesting to Russian business schools. When I am thinking about uh, the ranking uh, process as applied to business schools, uh, I remember an old adage uh, about an elephant and seven blind uh, sages, sages. So uh, when uh, an elephant arrived in the village, uh, the sages uh, uh, ran up uh, to them to, to it to understand what it's all about. Can I have the slide, please, or is it up to me? On my command, I don't have a clicker. <laughs> well, while they're looking for the clicker. So every one of these sages touched uh, it, uh, their parts of the elephant and got their own ideas. How does it work? Сначала включить надо. А есть куда? Право. So, every uh, one got their own ideas, uh, own images, and it looks very much uh, like different media uh, that compose rankings, uh, assigning uh, ranking uh, ratings or rankings uh, to such a complicated uh, thing as business schools. So it's clear that every uh, agency, every organization is uh, exploring its part uh, of uh, the elephant, setting their own uh, priorities. So our approach here is such that uh, the more uh, you can, uh, the farther outside you look at uh, the business school, uh, the better it is. And the more there are rankings, uh, the better. Danica expressed an idea that uh, trust to rankings and accreditation is going down. But it's uh, a universal uh, process. Uh, trust to the information that business schools uh, are uh, sharing is also going down. The most popular demand uh, at our uh, MBA Association website uh, are requests for feedback because uh, there are too few people who believe the information that we post. If you take a look at the websites of business schools, they're all, they all look beautiful. They all meet modern standards. And uh, you can read everywhere uh, words about you, the highest level of education that this business school provides, uh, perfect uh, faculty. Uh, everybody says that. And in our information-based world, uh, the consumer needs an external, a third party view, what other people have to say about this business school. And in the first place, it's graduates. Rankings are being criticized quite a lot, and in many cases fairly, uh, because of uh, the limitation in parameters that they use, uh, because of the fact they don't allow different groups of stakeholders uh, to make uh, necessary decisions, but at the same time, we understand that there are no, there is no such thing as a perfect ranking, and uh, it's also quite uh, clear that we're not go, we're not likely to see them in the foreseeable future. Two professors, Ruben and uh, Magasin, in their recent paper, uh, uh, reassessing quality. Uh, were criticized ratings and rankings, and as an alternative, they offered a quality uh, business school model that they uh, propose uh, that they propose for the ranking uh, agencies to use. So this is how it looks: nine blocks, 
each of them uh, splits uh, into 21 quality uh, quantity parameter, quality parameters, and they say they have about 400 metrics all told. And it's clear uh, that uh, it's very difficult to use this model, uh, building real-life rankings, because the number of subdimensions is so much uh, that uh, comparable, uh, selecting comparable parameters and ranking them together uh, looks quite uh, well, very difficult. So therefore, a question, who to ask? So very often in our reports, we uh, refer to the business community. The business community has to set some quality parameters, uh, to place some demands uh, on the future graduates of business schools. Well, the business uh, community doesn't have time to tell the to tell business schools what to teach to its graduates. Well, they do it indirectly through its representatives, through the through the students and learners who bring the latest business cases, the latest business practices uh, when they come to business school to study. Now, according to the General Director ma magazine, 42% of Russian managers uh, have an MBA uh, degree. And uh, under the MBA SU, 67% of top managers and business owners take part in those surveys. You know, there's the average portrait of a part-time MBA course. Now, those who take classes, they could be seen in all the areas of the business community. And they are the business community that's the business leaders that uh, we are often looking for and whose answers we actually would like to hear. The answers to pressing questions. There's another important uh, point. What was the motivation for all those uh, students that attended business uh, schools? So that we identify whether the school has uh, uh, has met their expectations. So actually you could have ticked more than one box, and that's why the overall figure is higher than 100 percent. So there's nothing about the Hirsch index. You don't have uh, any uh, professors with uh, an experience of more than five years. We don't have a um, share of foreign students. We don't have uh, share investments that is uh, used for uh, development. We don't have all these uh, traditional conventional parameters, but what we have is uh, leadership and ways to become more efficient, uh, both in your private and uh, in your private life and in your career. Like colleague said from AACSB, business education goes far beyond. The uh, ROI, it opens up more opportunities that you can harness to become a better person and a better leader. And so uh, your income in the next three years cannot be the only measure of your happiness and success. So this index was set up nine years ago, so we published nine rankings. We surveyed about 10,000 graduates uh, of different cohorts. This is the, these are the media that support the ranking, almost all the business uh, media outlets. What are the major principles? Free participation by business schools through their alumni. We send invitations to business schools, and there's just one request. Could you please circulate the information about the online survey among your alumni? No more contacts. No more contact with business schools. But the biggest question that uh, arises 
My, is my time up? Well, I'll call, what about the veracity of information? If we go back to the model uh, provided by our American colleagues, we have to acknowledge that almost all of the information will has to be taken from a business school itself. And so the uh, whether it's true or not, there's a big question over it. There are four criteria that gauge the satisfaction level. We decided not to introduce any adjustment figures, any multipliers, because that would make it more biased. And actually, it's hard to substantiate that bias and then explain the uh, resulting figures. So we can also group schools with minor differences, insignificant differences in the outcome. And you need 25 questionnaires filled by alumni of this, partic this particular year. This year, the 10th anniversary ranking will deal with alumni of, of 2016-2017 years. Well, we can do it for three years. Uh, sometimes you could have um, uh, graduation in uh, the winter or in the summer or in the spring. We put them in the tables and any consumer can look up the criteria that's ne necessary. That's growth in their income, that's their career growth, a level of contacts, business contacts, and personal development. And as a wrap up, my final thought, you cannot get rid of rankings because everyone needs them. Consumers need rankings because they have poor knowledge of, of what uh, is taught at business schools. Well, the business community doesn't know either. Well, actually, they don't know it. They want to get a simple tool of, that would enable them to rank it and to bring all of the vast information into order. But business schools need rankings as a marketing tool. That's it. The rest is on the slides. Giving to each of you five to six minutes. So please uh, keep in mind that, because I would like that they are for sure people having a lot of questions, you know, and so give us the chance to, to be answered also. Uh, I would like to ask you, Veronica, now to continue. Thank you very much, and soon I shall give you opportunity to public to ask the questions too. Yeah. Thank you so much. I don't have any slides because I wanted to stick, to stick with uh, the uh, a time limit. Two points. Why do we do rankings? Since 2013, we do our internal MBA ranking, but that's a, a peculiar thing because we have a lot of uh, MBA uh, degrees. And this is why we needed to have a clear understanding of uh, what are the distinctions, what are our strengths. We needed to find driver growth points. We need to benchmark ourselves against others. We drafted a strategy. We looked at the strategy. And they have uh, institutional criteria, which per pertains to the school, its international contacts stability and the second area was programs degrees you split we split everything into three levels international schools so with international accreditation international contact then national and local ones the strategic goal was initially is that local schools should either shut get uh, get shut down or grow to the uh, national level we have currently resolved this issue. And so also program-specific criteria. All the programs of the academy were like hotels, split into uh, stars. 
ranking between 1 and 6. So every program had to get at least one star. That's why it was between not between 0 and 5, but between 1 and 6. And market sustainability and the assessment by the market. These are the two criteria that we use to uh, gauge the efficiency of those programs. If for people are ready to pay, then it means it's in demand. It means it's uh, highly valued by the market. There's no secret that very often people come because of the word of mouth. It's a very powerful tool, apart from rankings. People do pay attention to rankings and to your rating. They read uh, articles, uh, and then they talk to their friends and uh, acquaintances. And very often, that buzz, that word of mouth, is more important than your ranking. And Ms. Chernigovsk uh, talked uh, previously at a previous session that the information environment is changing. So how do we collect information? We don't trust anyone. We don't even trust uh, uh, good uh, authoritative sources of news. And so she says people start asking their friends. And you've got uh, Facebook pages. You've got uh, web pages. It's easy to find people who would share everything with your Now, talking of rankings, I agree with the previous speakers. We do have rankings. They are imperfect, and they will continue to be imperfect, but not uh, just in the near term, but always. Everyone's looking for what they need, as both the schools, as the consumers, and those who do the rankings that need these rankings. And good rankings have major schools at the top, because there's a risk. If there's an unknown school somewhere at the top, then confidence to what that ranking goes down. But that's my subjective opinion. That's what I think. Perhaps I'm wrong. In terms of criteria, potential MBA graduates are also trying to figure out what I'm going to get in terms of contacts, in terms of the network, in terms of the skills. We all understand that a top-notch banking school diploma would still be in value. Well, what about Harvard and Stanford? If there's no ranking, Harvard and Stanford would still be trusted very much, would still be, their diplomas would still be recognized very much. But there are other schools, some are even more innovative, but they are younger ones, and so you cannot just rely on rankings. Rankings are still like the first step for customers. Any client needs to understand how to treat the information and whether that is a significant criteria for them or not that significant. Because if a good and expensive school yields very positive results, then it means it's still worth it. And very often people attend it. Uh, it's attended by people with a very good career start, with a very good income. But again, it all depends on what you read and how you interpret rankings. And I'd like to thank Yuri for his popular ranking. That's the way they do it. We get regular requests. We just circulate it among our alumni. I don't even know what the right. I don't know what's the how each individual alumni alumnus uh, ranks us. But again, potential customers use other sources of information, including word of mouth. 
Well, that's it. Thank you. And now I would like to ask Georgi Iliev, Director of Emerging Markets, AMBA. AMBA. Thank you, Danica. Uh, Yuri, можно мне пода... Thank you so much for the invitation. I will speak in English. I have three things to say and six slides to show you. I would like to start with the theme of war. It is war. Andrew, war. But it's not the war that you're thinking of. Rankings and accreditation compete in one major way, and that's the time of business school staff and leaders. Rankings and accreditation are managed by the same people at business schools. And the same deans and associate deans have to make the strategic decisions. The second thing I would like to talk about is two metaphors. Rankings are a bamboo forest. They are visible on the market, just like the bamboo, very visible, because these are very tall plants. But the roots are shallow. Rankings take into account 10, 20 met metrics criteria. And the bamboo is just like a ranking, a tall plant with roots that go down in the ground 60 centimeters up to a meter. Accreditation is a grapevine. It's not very tall. You don't talk about it all the time. It's not in the media. But it grows deep in the ground, up to 10 meters deep, the roots of the vine. And that's because we when we carry out accreditation, we don't look at 10 or 20 things. We probably look at three or 400 different factors and criteria. And a lot of them are qualitative, not quantitative. So even if we wanted to create a ranking based on all these criteria, we couldn't because qualitative factors are very difficult to compare. Does London Business School have a better career service than Shanghai University? We don't know. They're good enough to be accredited, but we cannot tell you what would be a better career service. And there is something else. The grapevine produces grapes. And the real value of accreditation is the consulting service. Accreditation is primarily of value to the leadership of the business school to drive change. In my seven and a half years at AMBA, I've been to 150 different accreditation and reaccreditation visits. And in two days, when we visit the business school, we focus on one particular thing, distinctiveness. We try to find and highlight and convince the school to be more distinctive. R rankings are a beauty contest. 
And the competition, as you can see, the competitors are all beautiful, but they look quite alike. And one gets the crown in the end. If your school is really distinctive, you wouldn't need to compete with everybody else because you'd be recognizable and recognized even without a crown. And you all know who this is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I didn't say in my introduction of uh, Georgi that he is writing a blog, a blog uh, about, uh, you know, the metaphor of uh, nature and management. And uh, so that's, uh, that's now I understand better, you know, seeing all this bamboo. <laughs> Bamboo and the raisins, so uh, grapes, I mean, <laughs> great. We have metaphor how to uh, learn from art, from music, from uh, visual arts, but he has from nature. And I just wanted to ask you how it goes, but now I start to understand. Thank you very much. Uh, next to you, uh, I wanted, I just made my order, and it is not without reason. Uh, I have here now Marco de Novellis. Uh, from GMAC, from, uh, from Business uh, Because Editor. So thank, you. Uh, thank you, Danica, and uh, thank you everyone for hosting me today. Um, so at Business Because and through our close relationship with GMAC, we are very close to the prospective graduate student market, uh, so students for Masters, MBA, EMBA, and Today, I'm going to give a little bit of insight into how far rankings are important for business schools when it comes to promoting themselves and attracting new students. Um, so, rankings are undoubtedly important in attracting new students. Um, this is uh, latest data from GMAC, which surveys over 11,000 prospective graduate business school students each year and 81% of prospective business school students globally consult rankings when researching schools. That's 80% for Russia and Eastern Europe. And here you can see Andrew will be very happy that Financial Times is the most consulted ranking in Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, but my argument today is that rankings are not everything. So, oh. They're not everything, they're not the be all end all for business schools when it comes to attracting new students. Um, firstly, rankings are just one thing that prospective students consider. So on the left of the screen is a very quick survey I did of 150 Business Because users who are prospective students and also important alongside rankings are things like cost of programs, careers, um, location, program, type. Now in 2015, GMAC asked over 11,000 prospective students for their top five consideration criteria when selecting, not just researching, but selecting a business school, and rankings did not rank. Accreditation was the most important, program types and their cost and local reputation important as well. So rankings also have some flaws. 2018 was a very good year for bad news about rankings, uh, which we covered, and we'll get onto those in the panel discussion uh, as well. But the obvious point is that no one ranking can be taken as fact. They are purposely designed to be different from one another. So that leaves prospective students in a difficult situation as well. But the biggest concern that many business schools have about rankings today and the industry is about their continued relevance. So here's some great data from Amber. Thank you, George. Um, and Amber asked over 300 senior business school staff, how much influence do you think rankings position has on demand for schools? And as you can see on the left here, the majority think rankings and demand are very linked. However, when these business school leadership were asked, how far do you think rankings reflect the true performance of MBA master's programs, 40% said fairly well, 43% said not very well, 10% said not at all well. So there's a problem here that business schools 
don't think rankings reflect the reality of their programs. They don't think that what they want to communicate about themselves is communicated well through a rankings table. And why is this the case? And it's mentioned before, international rankings, a lot of them are very focused on jobs data, salaries, and bonuses. Um, when careers today are changing, it's not all about jobs, and uh, obviously about jobs. It's not all about salaries being high. 25% of prospective graduate business school students globally want to start their own businesses and pay themselves. And uh, people are not just working in consulting or finance, which are very highly paid, but going into different industries, healthcare, um, even the nonprofit space. Now, for this final slide, GMAC segments the prospective graduate student market into seven categories, seven types of students, from respect seekers to impactful innovators. And the, uh, these seven types of students here, rankings can affect which types of student your business school attracts. And this can sometimes be counterproductive. So I actually work with a business school at the moment who are, have a program which is ranked number one in the world, um, a master's program, number one in the world by the Financial Times. And they're attracting a lot of students, but they're attracting a lot of respect seekers, people who care about status, who care about ranking. And this school really wants to attract global strivers, people after international careers, or impactful innovators, entrepreneurs. And so what they want to communicate about their school, they cannot do just through a rankings table. And so they're working with us on a content marketing campaign to really demonstrate the true value of a school, the personal experiences, the consideration criteria we mentioned before, um, in a way that they can't, beyond what they can do in rankings. So my argument today is, yes, rankings are important to an extent, but students consider other factors. Um, the business schools can communicate uh, what they want about themselves in a better way through different methods. And I think rankings really need to move away from a focus on salary data and towards what business school is about today, which I think is delivering on students' individual career goals. And we've heard a lot from accreditation bodies and, and they're working uh, closely with schools. And as journalists, I perhaps think to really serve prospective students, rankings uh, systems need to work closely with schools like accreditation bodies are, are doing as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. It's time that we now hear the public a little bit before we continue with still two presenters. Uh, and do, do you have any suggestion, any question to all the panelists, please? I, I would give to the lady the first, uh, the, uh, if you agree, hmm? and then to you. And please introduce yourself. Thank you. Yelena Skolonova, High School of Management at St. Petersburg University. I have a comment. And perhaps uh, I would like an answer. I don't know. I'm just sharing my experience. Over the, over the six years, we've been implementing together with the uh, High Commercial School of Paris uh, a joint program on a double degree executive MBA. Two high class schools, all possible accreditation in our case, except for ACSB. Uh, rankings everywhere were part of international uh, rankings, uh, number two or three in FT and others. In 2012, uh, graduates of this program, or some of the graduates of this program, uh, I mean, uh, and we're keeping in touch with them. Uh, based on your approach, Yuri, uh, polls, uh, graduate polls, and if we are to make any conclusions from that, it will turn out that graduates, alumni uh, of this high-class program from two excellent schools present in all rankings, so one of them, let, let, me, let me just quote, one lost his job and can't f find it now. Another one, 
an owner. Uh, he, uh, they stole business from him, uh, which he had spent two or three years building. There are three or four who remain in the same companies at about the same positions. That is, these people who graduated uh, from uh, this uh, reputed program uh, had fate like this. And so a question, I don't know what it testifies to. Is it about the schools being bad? No. Is it about the program being weak or deficient? No. Uh, is it about uh, people not being able to find the right purpose in life? I don't know. What, how can you comment that? And I have you know, lots of information uh, like that. Uh, it means that the graduates have different fates, destinies, and maybe we should differentiate between the question of a large-scale destiny and just a business program of some business school. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, as a point of clarification, we're dealing with an echo. We're dealing with only MBA programs. We don't uh, have a high, high school master's degree. As to the destinies, uh, there may be an infinite number of destinies. Uh, to sort them out according to some criteria, I think it's very difficult. At the same time, there's a certain uh, practice uh, that we've accumulated over the past nine years. Sometimes, uh, among the questionnaires, uh, we get, like for instance, 35 to 40 questionnaires have come back from a school. And perhaps one of them will be about a guy, someone going, get, getting unemployed. But it doesn't affect the overall result a lot. But of course, everything depends on the selection. Of course, if uh, we specifically select a number of people who lost their job and whose business was stolen from them, uh, we'll uh, focus on that. But on the other hand, uh, we can compensate that uh, by those uh, whose business have grown considerably and they got like 250% growth in revenue uh, after graduation. Then how to deal with that? I think it's a rhetorical question. I think it's uh, difficult uh, to take account of such uh, outliers. Although, uh, as a member of St. Petersburg, although uh, having a person uh, from St. Petersburg University, I would like to mention, I would like to see more activity of your graduates. Any questions? As uh, a co-moderator, you know, gentlemen, the fact uh, that the St. Petersburg uh, Business School is excellent, it's a great curriculum, we all know that. I'd like to put a different question. In this country, uh, there's a uh, mix, uh, mixing uh, going on uh, with different uh, master's uh, programs. And as a result, we're getting to a paradox. Uh, let me tell you a story that has nothing to do with your business school, but has to do with St. Petersburg. I had a guy in a business school working. Uh, he was at a great position, a very good person. And so he went back to St. Petersburg. And so he, a, a, colleague, of, a colleague of mine calls me from a St. Petersburg uh, management school, Sergei Mordovin. He says, Sergei, our market of good people is not so large here. He used to work for you two or three years. Tell me, and I quote, is it a, a creative uh, uh, member of intelligentsia after a uh, master's degree? Is it a manager? Or is it a manager with a talent for an entrepreneur? According to this scale, I said it's a very, it's a uh, very intelligent person, and said, "Got that? Uh, we have a lot of them, guys." Once again, I'm not talking about masters, university masters. Whenever we're talking for MBA, let's select those who have entrepreneurial potential. We are not teaching scientists, whereas in this country, there's always this confusion between genres. That's why uh, they put a lot of blame uh, on business education. It's not about your school or my school. Uh, it's about the situation in the country as a whole, where uh, they just confuse uh, between science-oriented and applied programs, where masters are considered to be the same thing, whether it's science masters or MBA. It's not the same. And how to explain it uh, to this country? We've spent 25 years trying to explain. Let's uh, join our efforts and try to understand. Uh, there will be less misunderstanding there. I'm sorry. Uh, it's just something that uh, feels very important to me. Thank you. From AMBA, who would like to Yeah, hi. Uh, Victor Hedenberg from AMBA and BGA. Uh, a thing that I've been thinking of recently with rankings is perhaps the problem with rankings is the transparency 
of the rankings. So when you look at rankings, of which there are many, you will see best liberal arts colleges in the USA or best M full-time MBAs in the world. But they don't say best full-time MBAs based on increased income or best executive M or best MBA on you know successful entrepreneurs or something like that. So maybe the problem is not that difficult to solve. Maybe this requires a bit more transparency in terms of what the ranking is based off so that people can filter these rankings based on what their needs are. So I just want to know what you guys think about that. Any reaction? Marco, Marco? Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I would uh, completely agree. And um, the thing is that we, we complain a lot that because one school is based in a certain country, they will be punished because their graduates don't get the salaries, they, uh, the high enough salaries to be well ranked. Some schools have complained that they're punished for uh, recruiting lots of female students because women are less well paid in some industries as well. As well. The truth is, what rankings tables do, uh, they do have uh, algorithms and whatnot to deal with these discrepancies, but it's completely opaque. We, we can't tell what those are a lot of the time. So that transparency is really important for prospective students and um, Yes, rankings want to stand out in newspapers and have 10 best programs in the world. But if you don't explain why and how, in a simple, digestible way, not in a very complex methodology, then you're misleading uh, prospective students. It's very clear. Uh, the rankings are like, like makeup. It's not the content, but it matters. Mm. It looks better mm. with the makeup. All these uh, beautiful ladies there, yeah. Georgi. Uh, <laughs> May I respond? Let let uh, let Elena now say, okay. and then and then we give you a chance. Come come come. We want to say Okay. I'll speak Russian because I'm from Russia. I'm I'm Elena Uskova and I work at uh, the Plikhanov University, and I have something to do with accreditation to some degree uh, beca uh, because I'm taking part in AMBA, ACUS, and APUS. i just just make a small comment and then ask a question. In my opinion, rankings or ratings and accreditations are two different animals, two different phenomena or, if you want, realities uh, that are an absolute must uh, for business schools, both. Because accreditation, uh, you we all know what it's all about. It's a total audit that is an absolute necessity for schools to understand where they are, how uh, to go forward, how to become better. Rankings are external, you know, views, makeup, as you said. Uh, it's a crown, it's a decoration, it's great. It's good uh, if uh, they, there are no wars among them, uh, but uh, some discrepancies are there because parameters used or dimensions used in rankings and accreditations are different. And we all know that as well. Therefore, my question, to which degree, and perhaps uh, this is a question to Yuri. To which degree, when selecting a business school, I mean Russia, and I'm talking about Russia because we're in Russia, and maybe uh, if uh, colleagues know uh, how it works globally, it would also be uh, interesting to hear. So to which degree rankings affect the choice uh, by prospective uh, students uh, of a school or program? Because how accreditations work, we know. Uh, the first question uh, that they ask of us uh, at uh, promos, at events, what accreditations does your school have? Or you, uh, quite often they say, do you have AMBER? If there's an employee at the booth who doesn't know this accreditation, they will say, what is that about? So uh, my question once again, uh, how rankings impact uh, the selection of schools by, by prospective students in Russia and globally? 
I'll just say a couple of words uh, about the previous uh, question regarding, uh, regarding uh, the simplicity. As I said, in the people's ranking, uh, uh, the, uh, there's a uh, zero to five scale uh, assessment, uh, sum and uh, just arithmetic, arithmetic average. No weights, because once uh, we introduce weights, uh, they start asking questions. Why this percentage? Who are the experts who invented this? Uh, so we specifically and intentionally did it this simple way to, for it to be clear and understandable. Now about the impact of rankings. According to our research, rankings are among the top three factors, top three factors, uh, that are taken into consideration by prospective students. A ranking uh, is a starting point uh, to collect information about uh, the business school, about a business school. And we've ran quite a lot of polls about that. First, uh, potential students look at rankings. Uh, then uh, they pick a school and they start collecting information about that school. Another in piece of information, about 70% to 80%, 85% of prospective students uh, consider uh, the school's position in a ranking when selecting it. So uh, here, a ranking uh, serves uh, as a measure of reputation. Uh, they affect one another. Sometimes they ask questions. Look, there's uh, a business school like this. Uh, it has been widely advertised in the internet. Why the, it, it, it's not part of rankings? So in people's understanding, so if it's a high quality business school, then uh, the natural question to ask is why it's not among the best business school in rankings. If possible, I can add partly uh, about the previous uh, comment, because I've also no mentioned, noticed uh, that a ranking is like information for thinking, food for thought. And in order, then uh, you have to decide how this rating had been calculated to make a decision. So I would strongly support uh, the transparency comment so that we should just understand uh, how these numbers uh, came about. As to the selection of a program, because uh, we recruit up to 300 pe people a year, just like uh, the Russian army, we recruit twice a year. And uh, we mention, we see in questionnaires as the main criteria to select the school rankings, accreditation, and then I go uh, to a day of, of open doors and then I start uh, trying to find uh, graduates uh, to talk to them. So rankings and ratings often work as the first source of information of what business schools are available uh, that I can research further if I'm looking for an MBA program. And then uh, you go deeper and uh, attempts uh, to have a uh, hands-on feeling. Uh, one uh, possible uh, potential students uh, once mentioned, I, w I just wanted to have a line of sight look looking uh, look into the eyes of people who are going to teach me. A global Education Editor from Financial Times. I know that you are not directly responsible, you are not indirectly nor directly responsible for ranking, but I'm sure that you know more about that than anybody of us here. So please, we are looking forward to hearing from you. Um, uh, great pleasure to be here. and. Um, even though this is called the rankings war uh, in the land of Tolstoy, I'm a great believer in peace. Um, and I'd like to connect some of the, the trends and comments of the different colleagues that we've heard. Though I think like George, I'm a, I prefer wine to bamboo. Um, um, but let me say first of all, um, as we heard from Yuri and others, uh, there clearly is demand for information and for understanding of business schools and what they teach. So to talk about <coughs> destroying the ratings, refusing to cooperate, whatever, seems to me pointless. Um, though I think, as we heard from Marco, um, rankings are important, but they're not all. They may not be, according to some of those surveys, even the top priority amongst students in trying to choose between business schools. Um, 
And then the third point is that um, it's extraordinary to me how seriously, and I respect it, the business schools take rankings, particularly if they're not <laughs> high up in the rankings. Um, and the business schools invest a huge amount, and the business schools even often create incentives around faculty and deans linked to the rankings. My point is, you know, therefore the business schools themselves should first of all reflect on the priority and even the obsessiveness that they're giving to rankings. We at the FTT take rankings seriously, we do it rigorously, but I sometimes hear um, the FT, the Economist and others talked about as rankings agencies, as though we're like, you know, Moody's or Standard & Poor's with hundreds of staff pouring for months and months over millions of data points. Do you know how many people actually work on business rankings in the FT? Roughly one full-time equivalent person. Um, and they're doing something like eight rankings throughout the year. But what are we also doing, including me and various colleagues, is writing, um, as Marco was saying, actually across the piece about business education and around trends in education. So my plea to you is please don't just think of or primarily think of what the media are doing, what we are doing around business education as being simply about rankings. If you want, and we try to provide lots more nuances on innovation in teaching, on diversity in recruitment, on a lot of national and cultural and regional specificities in business education and trends. Don't just look at you know, one table that comes out each year. Look at coverage we're providing in a much more nuanced and often qualitative way across a very wide range of articles almost daily. So, and then I think if we're going to talk about you know, resources and priorities, let me just go through four other, if you like, stakeholders in this whole process. And the first one of those is the students themselves. Now, you know, I'm sorry, but if somebody who's applying, even at the undergraduate, certainly at the master's level, for a business degree is not capable of data analysis, of uh, spreadsheet use in order to analyze and compare, compare a wide range of data in a very complex world, then they probably shouldn't even be studying for a degree, let alone practicing business before and afterwards. Um, I heard the point about transparency, it's a very valid one, but you know, I would say, I'm not gonna speak for others, but if you go to our site, it's very transparent. Um, you can understand our weightings, you know, I will respect to distinguished Russian uh, academics who've analyzed them, but anybody could go to our rankings and work out what the weighting is of salary. Um, you can look at all the raw material, you can download and manipulate and recalculate as you choose. So if you're interested in the international composition, in the gender split, in the fees, in the country, in the outcoming salary, in the academic ranking, all of this information is available and transparent and downloadable and manipulable in an easy form. So, of course, if you're going to superficially say the FT or The Economist or US News or whatever has said, you know, school X is number one and you don't go any further, of course, you'll get our or their distilled view according to our judgment and rankings and weightings. But actually, you should, particularly if you're going to invest a lot of your time and your money in business education, spend a bit more of it to look at the options and the different data points and to recalculate. And the second thing is, you know, though you're, you know, these are business schools, we're ultimately talking about fundamentally questions of return on investment and value for money. So if you're going to invest all of that, you expect some reward, and therefore I'm not surprised that for most business school students, the uplift in their salary at the end of their course is going to be a very important factor that they take into account. Go through the four stakeholders. The second accreditation, I think you're absolutely right. I think there are some very interesting questions about whether the existing accreditation approaches are based on inertia and a historical approach of what makes a good business school. Um, but again, you know, we use that as a starting point because you need some control on quality of the underlying nature of the courses. Um, but I agree the accreditation agencies and the business schools should reflect on whether that model of accreditation needs changing. But we can't take on all of that responsibility. We have to rely on the experts to do that initial assessment, judgment, filtering, which is a criteria for entrance. Um, 
The third area is the business schools themselves. As I said, maybe they're a little bit over obsessive about rankings. Um, they're setting fees. They have a responsibility. They're in a market to understand that and try to be able to justify what they're charging in order to show what's being delivered. Um, and I think, you know, while on the one hand, um, it wouldn't be fair to say that you can, um, you know, if students have gone through and then their business has been stolen or they've been unemployed or whatever, to blame that entirely on their business school training, nor would it be that easy or holistic to say that necessarily, you know, students who've been through business school X or Y, which then has had, or their companies have had some litigation or unethical practice, it's also entirely the fault or the, the credit of the business school in training and ethics. You know, individuals have many factors that make up their subsequent behavior. But what I think is absolutely fundamental in higher education and is not sufficiently reflected on is that return, that value. And what's probably the single key metric, it really should be the, stu the incremental student benefit, the outcome the student has got through going through. It's great to see Yuri and others doing these assessments of alumni, but you know, there are a couple of problems, right? N, equ N equals one, you know. <laughs> there are very few uh, alumni who've been to more than one business school and therefore have had the experience. And even those who have been through multiple business schools will have done so at different stages in their life and their professional development. So without a random control, randomized controlled trial, it would be very difficult for us to understand really what the genuine impact of a particular school uh, was on an individual student. But I would throw that out. You know, Business schools have resources and many experts, and they should think more about that process as the fundamental one. And just my final point, the wider society, which also has a role. You know, as I say, we are primarily talking here about business schools, and therefore their focus has to be significantly on preparing people for the world of business. I think there's a serious question in higher education more generally about the development of managerial skills, of soft skills, people who want to go into the non-profit sector, people who have non-financial incentives. I very much sympathize and find that interesting. Um, arguably, it's not the business school that should be the key place to learn those skills. There should be a wider range of professional education institutes catering to those wider needs. So just in conclusion, um, I'm not trying to be defensive. I mean, I can tell you, and you will see it in a few days with our latest MBA ranking, we've hired a new team preparing the rankings. We're very open at this point to stock taking. There's a number of different reports, not only Seaman, but several others that are coming out at the moment reflecting on what should be the data and the criteria in assessing business education. And we're very open, you know, whether it's ethical issues, nonprofits, diversity of all sorts. I think there are a lot of things that are part of a debate. The key challenge to this community is, you know, can you measure it objectively and consistency, consistently across a wide enough range of schools that we and others can then take that data and make something useful and comparable out of it. But so we're very open to, to the debate. Um, but I think, you know, if we're going to start talking about wars, we have to also reflect on responsibilities, and they go much wider than um, media organizations doing rankings as they stand now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy with uh, some, of your, uh, uh, some of your promises that you also are doubting about and planning to change. I think that certainly uh, the fact that only uh, that, the accredit that the school must be accredited if it goes for ranking, perhaps some institutions just want to go to ranking and not to accreditation, you know? So that means that you have to employ a half person more to really to look for, from scratch, you know? And really some more attention, and now I'm talking as the president of Siemens, you know? Uh, really, because, you know, I have 220 schools there, 20, 230, uh, that, and everybody thinks that there should really be, uh, should really be more attention to innovations and not a tendency to make all the school the same. Because we need in this world, like you said by yourself, I didn't use this word, diversity and differentiation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I would like that, because I heard that you were leaving us soon, I would like now to give the, floor, the, give the floor to the public if you have still some questions for, uh, for Jack. Yes, please. 
Thank you, Jack. That was highly informative. I am Sajjal Sagal, and I'm from India. I'm attending a leadership conference at Ranipa, and that's why I'm here at Gaidar as well. Uh, my question is going to be a little forward-looking, uh, but requires maybe uh, us to look at the very uh, topic that we have today uh, by taking a step back. By before we get into the criteria of how to create uh, how to create different criteria, what are the different parameters through which we are thinking of putting these different verticals together? So. Uh, uh, We've got a lot of different kind of courses coming up, right? Like there are courses on big data, there are courses of analytics, there are courses of finances, which are still bus business oriented. Uh, and if we say that if we have to compare these with uh, uh, rank, I mean, we have to compare these with standard or quintessential MBA schools, that kind of brings us to an apple to oranges sort of comparison. Uh, however, is there a way, and I know that maybe this is demanding too much, to rather than considering the factors as more market oriented when i say that you know how much is going to be the salary or what kind of alumni network is there which basically comes back to the concept of capital what is the social capital that i would be earning or what is the 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 capital in terms of money that i will be earning to more student and communi ori community oriented for instance having parameters like mental health acceptance of international pupils within uh, uh, you know, not just acceptance in terms of the percentage, but also how are they treated once they're inside the university? Are there any programs to ensure that anyone who's lacking certain soft skills is trained before they're put into that whole batch? Cases of sexual harassment, how are people treating cases of sexual harassment in a school? So I'm talking about taking more of the student profile and also in terms of the community. Uh, can these elements also be somehow oriented into the rankings so that it's a few, few like it actually prepares someone to put in the ethics in the business as well. And no, I'm not talking about people managing NGOs or MPOs. I'm talking about people who will actually be managing, let's say, the BCGs or Bains or the McKenzie's of tomorrow. But they're ethically very sound because of that. That's the kind of education that they've had at the MBA school. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a direct uh, reply, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think mental health issues, for example, fundamentally important. You might see in the FT today, I was behind a big magazine called um, Health at Work which focuses and actually collects data on employers and employees, so top down and bottom up, on physical and men mental welfare factors and interventions employers are doing. So we're constantly, with many different editorial projects, trying to identify practices that work and trends. How easy would it be to systematically put that into a consolidated ranking around business schools? I'm a bit less convinced. You know, if you have ideas, I'd, I'd love to hear them, but I... Um, you know, what I don't want, and this is a much wider comment, you know, I'm very concerned about the dominance of the culture of audit and box ticking. And I, my fear would be, for example, on something like sexual harassment, how does that get measured? You know, does a school have a 50-page guidance note or a counsellor on or a whatever? Um, you know, does it have 20 or 1 or 500 complaints? You know, you can build a huge amount of data and suck up a huge amount of resource without, frankly, necessarily fundamentally getting to the bottom of whether the values or the influence in the individual school is, is there. But, but yes, and then on ethics, the day, you know, and responsibility and social capital, fascinating. But, you know, so it's out to the community. You know, you've got all these experts in these business schools. Give us the metrics that we need. Because, you know, I could be at, you know, name, pick your multinational and claim to be um, working on, you know, improved environmental responsibility or being a good citizen, corporate citizen and paying taxes. Um, am I having greater or less impact um, than if I was working for an NGO lobby from the outside on those things, very difficult to quantify. But, you know, I'd love to hear more ideas on it. I agree with you. The, the only thing I believe we have to realize is that from us, it depends a lot from leadership and management education, how, how we bring up the, the, the managers. It depends a lot where the society will go. And I think that we should all every day come to the job with this, you know, in mind. I have to do something good to develop people, to be better people for better society. In this respect, I, uh, I would like to mention that we are happy that you are here and that you hear the opinions of people. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I would like now to give the floor uh, to Sergei Ermak, the deputy director of analytics center of Expert, a very important Russian organization. Uh, Thank you so much. I really like the message. Let's stop wars and let's make 
peace. And it's good that I'm the last one because we don't want any wars. We don't want to engage any wars. We don't want to wage any wars. We don't call it a ranking. We call it a map. It's a map of uh, school visibility. We did a very bad thing, and uh, Mr. Masayedov will uh, condemn us. We mixed MBA and uh, bachelor's and master's degrees. But overall, I think it quite fits the goal of this study. And our second principle is that we rely on objective, unbiased data. Regardless of the ranking, we make sure that you can then verify our data in one way or another. А, сначала включить нужно. Помогите, пожалуйста, коллеги. Anyway, whatever. So, mobility, student mobility, it's been on the rise compared with 2015-2016. By 2026, it is supposed to double. And what you can see is that Russia and this mobility map is quite high. If you, can, if, you can, if you benchmark Russia against CIS countries and Eastern European countries, you can see that Russia is quite in a good uh, position. However, concerning quality, 80, 85% are CIS students and Asian students, Western students, European students are reluctant to come to Russia. However, we need to uh, exploit the fact that management and econo econ economics is a third popular area. So what do we try to do? What's the visibility of in these institutions at the global level? Now, if they are visible, that means that our business education delivers high quality. You need to have international accreditation. You need to have a network of international partners and publications uh, in top international magazines. There are other criteria, certainly, like case publications, course publications. These are extras. Well, everyone keeps uh, criticizing us, saying the publications is too highbrow. You know, considering publications too highbrow, it's too scientific, but we still believe it's very important. Publication activity is a telling sign, and uh, um, it's, it's uh, is a sign of prestige among Western specialists. Well, since AACSB has not ranked any Russian business school, we took semen, either in institutional or program accreditation, and our lowest threshold was 25 publications in top magazines. But even with these modest requirements, what we see is that there are just 35 schools on the CIS ter territory. Russia is leading with 26 schools. Mark Leaker stopped working again. Stopped working again, sorry. 
Uh, talking of international accreditation, there are even fewer schools who have this quality sign, the stamp of excellence. In terms of publications, our second criteria, well, that list is not updated. I think the website was uh, shut down, so we had to use our own criteria to strike out some of the magazines. And there are three criteria that we relied on. The big number of uh, articles from other countries, dramatic change in uh, publication activity. What we saw here was that in economics and management there were about there have been about 3000 articles and 1000 articles belong to the predatory magazine category well we call them predators or vulture but uh, you know a third of all of their articles we believe that that is a uh, telling sign of the quality of our business schools. Now, what you see here is some info on Nazarbayev University. That's the quality of uh, articles. And you can look at it more. They have, have very good quality in terms of co-authoring, in terms of uh, citation. And finally, dual degrees, uh, partners, partnerships, 35 schools that are partners. Here are the leaders, quite obvious, High School of Management in St. Petersburg and other schools are among the top. And you also we also rank them by uh, dual degrees. So what was the ultimate goal? We want to do, do a map and see what universities today are, could be called global, what universities are aspiring, or budding ones, and those who are still making their first steps. So three categories. So the only globalized university is the St. Petersburg uh, School of Management. And we have their representative here. I'm sure they are proud of it. There are many who would like to be globalized, and they do a focus on partnership and accreditation, but not on publications. There's a long list of business schools that are making their first steps. I don't want to voice the outcome, but I'll try to respond to the initial question instead. So how do you design this cri these criteria, the criteria that will be that will fit the market needs. I liked uh, what uh, Danica, what Ms. Borg said earlier, how ethical it is, how ethical business, grad business school graduates are. We've been thinking hard about it. We would like to uh, gauge uh, the entrepreneurship activities, the entrepreneurship spirit at schools and also the moral principles of our gradu of the graduates. So far, the uh, principles have not been that um, convincing. Number of graduates who founded an international startup or a startup that's part of the top list, or they are the, the CEO or hold some executive position. So that's maybe one of the criteria. Uh, the whole reason uh, for this poll was uh, that uh, the selection would always uh, be biased otherwise. However, we try to fix it. I think I'm done. Thank you very much. So we are at the end, but I would still ask the organizer to give us five minutes so that we can put proper questions also to our last speaker and any other comment from the, you know, from panel or from public. Unless you are all exhausted, 
from our talking. And you know the organizers invented the, the title war because they were thinking it's the end of forum and we have to make something, you know, very special title so that everybody comes to see how we shall fight here. What is we want to make peace. That's why we are here, you know? Danica, can I say one thing? Yes, yes, please, please, please. Both rankings and accreditation aim to reduce complexity. And when, to your question, when, when someone asks me, a friend or an acquaintance, where should I do an MBA? My answer is, do an MBA in the city where you'd like to live in after you graduate. Because of two reasons. One is career opportunities. You have access to all those companies through your uh, career service. And second is the alumni network. Because apart from, from work, there is life, and you'd want to be surrounded by people and friends you know. So uh, that reduces vastly the complexity of making a choice. If you decided to do, OK, Moscow is a big city, as is London. But um, even in Moscow and London, there are up to a dozen um, credible institutions that you'd need to compare, not hundreds as in rankings or a thousand as in the accredited schools worldwide. Just 30 seconds. I absolutely agree with the last statement because just because when we were doing our research, when we were drawing our map, uh, we asked the question to some business schools, why don't you get accreditation? Why don't you strive to get into ratings? And they say, why? And this dilemma, you know, why? The why with the thought that we train people for the local market. Uh, local business is happy about what we do. Uh, we're just top class. We don't need anything else. And this dilemma, uh, I mean, uh, we've been encountering that uh, for the whole duration of our work. What to uh, look at, what to look to, what kind of business, business that's abroad. I'm not going to say that their economy is more advanced. But I mean, uh, are we uh, going to look at some super advanced trends in Western Europe or America, or just to uh, look at opportunities here to earn money right here and now? If you allow me. I will also make a small comment in conclusion. Indeed, largely speaking, uh, there's no war here. And uh, both rankings are needed, depending on your purposes. Accreditations are needed, and it's up to the schools why you need that. Uh, are you prepared to uh, focus on that or not? But as in a very well-known verse, all sorts of mom mamas, mothers are needed. Uh, and just to conclude, George offered us a lot of great metaphors today. I uh, certainly like the metaphor of a beauty a pageant. But uh, recently, I uh, uh, saw a research uh, that those women uh, who lead in beauty pageants, who come uh, from not advanced countries, Venezuela, Vietnam, Filipina, uh, Philippines. Uh, so there's a lot of room for everyone. Everybody is beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Uh, great. Uh, thought uh, has been mentioned here. I think it has also been part of the Siemens Memorandum. Uh, now, many business schools uh, in uh, their chase for ratings and, and accreditations uh, reduce their attention uh, to uh, their main mission. A, a fair comment. I would be just happy if Russian schools took part in this race. Why? Because you need to do something for that. Actually, quite a lot. It's not enough uh, to uh, write on your website that business is happy with us. But who has actually asked this business? So therefore, both participating in the rankings, you have uh, to have a quite large number of satisfied uh, graduates. Uh, and to get that, uh, you need to put an effort in teaching them. And also accreditation is quite uh, a laborious process, you know, uh, generating reports, analyzing your activity, adjusting, bridging gaps. So let all our business schools, uh, in addition to those who are accredited with AMBA, I think there are 12 of them, take part in this race. And then we'll know who is who. Thank you. You know, such a meetings are certainly good that uh, the ones who are 
evaluating us, hear our opinion. And I, when I traveled through Latin America, I saw two schools accredited by one big accreditation and four with the other one in Latin America, the whole continent. You come to Russia, you can see what, what is here happening. And nobody will say that in 27, eight years that you have managed education, there is no five schools that could, would deserve any of these international accreditations and being ranked somewhere. So I think that it's good that these people who are dealing with evaluation know about you and about us. And that is also our role. And this was one of the, I think, good things that we also learned from them. I never imagined that they are transparent. I learned today that financial times ranking is transparent. And I would like to conclude with what Veronica said, you know. She liked the, I like the bamboo because I have it a lot of my garden around. But, and I know how deep it goes. But she liked this with the beautiful women, beautiful contest. And she said also in Filipino can be the beautiful contest. I think that also Russian schools and Slovenian schools and all others from less developed world can become the stars, the beauties, you know? And, uh, uh, and um, I wanted still to say something at the end. Uh, you know also why we have a big advantage? Because we don't need 20 years to unlearn. We just learned. And now we have something to show. And we, we, we have very broad education. And, and this is a, and the open mindset. And this helps you to, um, uh, to be open for other things, to be innovative, etc. Now, we are not 100 years old schools. So we have much more opportunity, in my view, to, to, to reach some standards, to be innovative and, and relevant for the society where we live. This is how I see this panel today. And I would like to thank you all, because each of you really contributed a lot. And I have to say, I learned a lot. And I'm sure you did too. So thank you very much also for your kind participation. Thank you. And a lot of success. Yes. And don't worry, just go for it. <laughs>